10 a.m. to 1 p.m. This workshop has been organized by Department of Telemedicine and Advanced Center for Evidence-Based Child Health, PGIMER Chandigarh. So again, I would like to extend a warm welcome. I want to give you all a brief outline of what this workshop is all about. We start with writing a protocol that begins with components of a protocol, followed by writing the scientific background review of literature. Then what are the ethical considerations we need to consider while writing a project? Then on the second day, we'll know about the scientific methods based on study designs, then important inputs on statistical analysis and sample size calculation. And we end this workshop by referencing an end note. So beginning with the first session, the first session is components of a protocol, which will be taken by Professor Meenu Singh, who's a professor of pediatrics at PGIMER Chandigarh, as well as the principal investigator of Advanced Center of Evidence-Based Child Health. I would like to welcome you, ma'am, and request you to begin with the talk. Thank you very much, Hanu. Uh, first of all, welcome everybody for this workshop today uh, on development of a protocol. Uh, I'll first like to tell you a little bit about the workshop that we are going to do. The purpose of this workshop is not just to deliver a few talks and uh, finish with that. It's basically a mentoring program for all of you to actually develop a research protocol. When we were going through the list of participants who have enrolled for this uh, course today, uh, or for this workshop today, I could find that there are several faculty members of different uh, institutions who are there. Uh, there are uh, residents, there are PhD students, there are other researchers who are there who want to write or participate in a research study. Now, the, the way we will be conducting it is, uh, we want to do it in an interactive way. So people who are connected on Zoom platform today, they, I request them to put on their videos so that we know that you are actively participating. And you post your questions onto the chat box, as well as you are free to raise hands. You can, in Zoom, you can actually show a raised hand and then you can ask a question, uh, which we will take, it, take up so that you get all points clarified and actually start writing a protocol. As you know, you must be having something in your mind which is bothering you, which is uh, a question to which you find, need to find an answer. So a research question is extremely important and I would request all of you to think of a research question on which you are going to write your research protocol. At least, you should select a field in which you are going to be working. And I'm sure all of you have designated areas of work. You belong to different specialities of medicine and you have different areas of research which are in your mind, which could be basic research, which could be clinical research, which you know we can be uh, taking up. And there could even be some systematic reviews which can be done these days uh, uh, as a part of review of literature. So the first lecture, which I'm going to give you is basically just the outline of a research proposal. That means what are the different parts of a research protocol? So as I said earlier, the most important thing for a research protocol is the title. And the title is actually the research question. It's, it actually tells you about what is the field you're going to be working in and what is the main methodology that you are going to be using. Uh, there is no standard format for writing a title, but still it should convey uh, what you're going to be doing in your total research proposal. Then comes the question of, a, then the next part of a research protocol, after you have a question with us, you want to know what is the state of existing knowledge on that particular question. And that is the background. That means you want to know what is the background knowledge which is there for that particular question which you are going to explore. 
and that background should be clear. As you can see in this picture, there is a rose with a background and there is another rose with another background. And you can see the second picture probably is much more clearer, which gives a perspective to the picture. And similarly, when we look at a scientific protocol and we look at a research question, we want to explore what is already there on that particular problem, which is published or unpublished, or something which you have been working on even earlier. And that has provided a background for your future work. Then that is something which you should be thinking of when you're thinking of uh, writing a research protocol. Now we know in that in these COVID times, a number of topics which we had been working on earlier, they have been kind of put in the background because at the moment COVID is occupying a lot of research space uh, in uh, most of the organizations. And different calls of, for proposals also which are coming, they may be related to COVID. Uh, uh, COVID problem, which is there. Now, there are different type of problems which are there, which can be addressed even in, you know, if we take an example of COVID-19 infection. We know that this is a very new disease. We had no idea of how this disease is going to spread, what proportion it is going to take. So there are several epidemiological factors which are important. So a number of questions which could be related to epidemiology of COVID-19 can also form a research question. The second thing is its pathophysiology. Nobody knew how this uh, virus affects our cells, what are the changes it produces inside the cells and rest of the tissues and the organs, how it affects them. But now we know that a number of, uh, you know, uh, series have been published millions and millions of cases have been seen and researchers have tried to formulate what is the kind of clinical presentation. And they've also worked a lot on the basic pathophysiology to such an extent that we now know that we have now even developed a vaccine against this particular virus. And people are going into clinical trials for various therapies which are there, which can be useful for this particular infection or they're going for clinical trials for using vaccines in different age groups. So these are the different types of questions which have emerged in the current scenario also, even if you don't think of the previous problems which were existing with us and a whole lot of us were working on different type of diseases, like we were working on tuberculosis, bronchial asthma. You all must be having something in your mind on which you want to frame a question so the first thing you do is to uh, frame a question. And then we see what is the type of question that you come with. So everything is actually there in the research question, which is of extreme importance. Now, this research question can be of different types. If it is relating to basic sciences, it can be explorative in nature about something that we have no knowledge about. You just want to see. Uh, what is happening in that particular disease. For example, when we took the uh, example of COVID, uh, we know that uh, COVID is much less common in uh, children or it has a much uh, less severe disease in children. So what are the reasons for that? You want to explore the reasons for that by doing some basic fundamental studies. So that would be a research question by itself. The second part is if you want to take up clinical questions, then clinical questions are, in, are plenty. There are different interventions which are being tried in uh, say COVID infections and similarly in the other diseases as well. And then you will see that that would be an intervention question which you take for therapy. Most of the therapy questions uh, to start with, um, they are actually intervention questions, but they may not be in the form of clinical trials right in the first go. Initially, sometimes you have to look at the clinical experience or you have to conduct an observational study with close monitoring of patients if a new therapy is being tried. So there are different steps and different trials, like phase one, two, and three, uh, trials which have to be done before the intervention comes into the market and we call it as phase four trials. So similarly, in, uh, there can be other type of research which could be relating to effects or the risk factors or the prognosis of a particular uh, uh, condition which is determined by the risk factors. 
For example, if you have certain risk factors in the case of COVID, if the patient is uh, suffering from hypertension, diabetes, obesity, then the possibility of a, you know, a better outcome is less and the prognosis may be worse in these conditions. So similarly, there may be other diseases in, you have, in which you have other risk factors. They also form, can form as your research questions. So what I uh, request all of you to do is that please uh, uh, formulate a research question in your mind right now, write it down on a piece of paper, and then I will ask you to do something to that research question. So the research question uh, should be clear. It should be a clear statement of facts. It should be logical. It should not be something which is out of context. It should be very relevant. It should be feasible. Many times we think of things which may not be feasible in our settings. For example, we may not have all the technology to implement whatever this research question demands. So you have to be realistic and you have to see whether that particular research question will be feasible in a particular setting or not. So this is uh, just a question which I formulated. It's, uh, uh, you know, like what is, a, what is better for children in rain, umbrella or raincoat? Now you are looking at two choices for an intervention for children where uh, you want to see whether umbrella or a raincoat is a better intervention. So this is just a question. How you're going to address this question will depend on what kind of study design you will do. Whether you will uh, take 100 children, give some an umbrella and others a raincoat, send them into rain and then find out what, is, what effect it has had on wetting them or what is their own experience about this. So those are the outcomes which have been used in that particular situation. So every question, whichever you think about, I thought of a simplistic question, but you can think of many complex questions. And every question has four or five parts. And as listed here, this is P. P is the population on which you're going to be working. I is the intervention. So it is not always an intervention. Sometimes it may just be an exposure. For example, we may have a question that how many children after wet, getting wet from rain will develop upper respiratory symptoms or will develop a common or cold. So there you are again addressing children and here rain is actually an exposure and you want to see how many of them develop uh, some problem related to that. So that is a, a exposure type of a question or a uh, a, a, a question which is more observational in nature and there is no intervention which is involved in this. So, so this I can be E at times and then you have C which is the control or the comparator. For example, if you are giving, uh, you know, if you want to uh, see which of these two interventions, umbrella or raincoat is better in rain for children, then you want to see the raincoat may be a comparator and umbrella may be an intervention that you are doing. But sometimes you may say that you're not using anything or you're using something very different from uh, whatever interventions have been given to you. So there is one is an intervention, the other one is a control in this particular situation. Similarly, even in studies which are for exposure, there could be a, a group which is not exposed to that particular uh, exposure. For example, when you're talking of rain, there may be, uh, you can take a cohort of children who are not exposed to rain at all and then see how many times they develop common cold. So then that will make it clear whether rain actually leads to common cold or not. So these are some of the questions and how you want to analyze them. And ultimately, so each question that you have should have these components. So the first one is population. The second one is intervention or exposure. The third one is comparator or a control. Fourth one is O, O is an outcome. So what is an outcome in this condition? In this particular condition, the outcome was whether the children are getting wet or not, or whether the children after getting wet are having some problems or not, or what is the feeling that the children are having, you know, by using an umbrella or a raincoat. So that can be a patient related outcome you know, something which the patient tells that, yes, I like this particular intervention. So then is a question of T. T is time. 
and you want to see how long an, uh, an intervention has to be given, which is measured in. So it may not be there in all the studies, but in most of the studies, duration of intervention is also important and that is denoted as T. So every question actually has a T, it has an intervention, a comparator, an outcome, and a time duration for which this exposure is given. Sometimes this time duration is implicit in the intervention itself or the exposure itself. For example, a single exposure sometimes may not cause any problems, but repeated exposure to a particular toxin may lead to problems uh, in health of those patients. So this is how the questions have to be framed. So I hope you have all uh, taken down uh, your uh, pen and pencil and you have written down your questions. And uh, this is what I have just spoken. This is population or problem, that is P. Intervention or exposure, that is I or E. Then is the comparators, then is the outcome, and then it is the time. So, then we will be going to the background and the various components which are there in the background. A part of this will also be uh, taken up by my next speaker, that is uh, Dr. Anil Johan, in which he'll be talking about the background in a greater detail. So after you have described the PCOT, uh, you have decided about the PCOT and you've written down on your paper, you must describe these components one by one in the background. For example, if you are worried about COVID or if you're writing your project about COVID, you must write about this disease. If you're addressing children, then you must write about this disease in children. Then you may add a quote or a story to start with sometimes when you're writing your project that this is something which we have been working on. These are the results which have been there. Or if you have not been working on this, some other investigators have been working on this. And these are the problems which are there in the studies previously. So we have to be factual in details. Whatever is there, published in literature, it should be absolutely evidence-based. So all that is published in literature is not evidence because an evidence is something in which you have actually appraised the findings which have been published in the literature. So the ultimate aim is to say, why are we going to do the study? Why have we taken up this particular question? It is said that uh, you should, most of the research uh, validity lies in the research question. If the research question is good, then your project is actually going to be good. And it is also felt that uh, many of the questions, if, uh, if, a, if, a, if you already know an answer to a particular question, in that case, uh, there is no need to repeat that particular you know, uh, research which has already been done. So think of a question, the answer to which is not known, and you have already searched literature for that. And we will be giving you different strategies for searching literature in different databases. These days, it's very easy with the help of internet. You can search PubMed, you can search Embase, you can search Cochrane Library, Ovid database. There's so many databases in which knowledge is there. And you can find out whether the question, whether the answer to the question you're trying to ask is already there or not. Because if it is already there, then it is better to systematically review literature rather than conducting a primary study again. So if you already know the answer to a particular question, it is better to find a new topic. So the background is actually a bridge towards the aims. Aims means aims and objectives of for a particular research protocol. Because the next thing which you write after you've written the background, then you want to actually write, what do you want to do? What is the aim of your study? So you should be very explicit about that particular aim. So in review of literature, one has to find what is already known on the topic before saying why we want to do the study. Hence, an exhaustive review of literature is in place. So I'm not going to be talking to you about uh, whether we should be doing uh, a systematic review. Dr. Anil Johan will be taking, out, taking up some of, the, uh, some of the points, but we knew that in the times of COVID when primary research on this particular disease was not available, so most of the people were actually doing a systematic review of literature, which was there either in coronavirus, which was non-COVID, or in other respiratory viruses. 
And we saw a number of systematic reviews and rapid reviews which were conducted on, in this particular field. But now we have a lot of research and there is a scope. There are lots of patients and we don't know about the best therapy, the best approaches. Hence, now the field is rife to have more study questions and do some primary research on uh, this, uh, these particular patients. So uh, then there is the need for doing the studies. So I will stop at that. And if there are any questions, I would like to answer them. If you could just pass them on from the chat box, if it is there. Uh, here, actually, uh, I'm not finding any questions. Uh, so I think uh, we will have another question answer session uh, after we have finished our talk on uh, uh, the searching literature literature searching and that talk is going to be given by Dr. Anil Chauhan. Thank you, Juan, for a very informative session on this. Uh, I would now request Dr. Anil Chahan, who is a consultant at the Health Informatics Unit at Department of Telemedicine, to begin with his talk on background or, science, or review of literature. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, as the Dr. Meenu Singh has already uh, created a platform for me for my talk. Uh, my talk is on the writing the scientific background or the review of literature for the PICOS. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that my talk will be revolving about uh, uh, how to write a, 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 a specific review of literature if you are writing for a systematic review or you are writing for a research proposal or you are writing uh, for your thesis. So it will be similar uh, on the similar pattern uh, I will be talking about. Another thing, uh, I will be talking about something about the PICOs, which Dr. Minu Singh has uh, also discussed. So these are some of the important things. First of all, uh, while uh, writing a proposal, uh, we need to focus on the research question, as Dr. Minu Singh has said, that uh, a specific research question will, uh, will be responsible for the whole study or the research uh, proposal you, you are creating. So it will, uh, it will be either uh, relating to any epidemiological or it could be a clinical or it could be interventional prognostic. So it depends upon your research question, then you have to frame the study designs, which could be in a, a, any experimental or it could be uh, observational. In experimental, it could be the RCT you have to do, or in observational, you, you might have to do the case control study or cross-sectional studies, uh, or otherwise you might have to do the surveys also. So first of all, we will see that uh, what is the review of literature? It is a, a summary of all the reviews from the various research literatures which are related to the current study which being, being carried out by you. So, uh, and it helps to discover what is already known about the research problem. Uh, according to the uh, previous study, the material gathered in the literature review, it should be included as a part of the research data since it influenced the problem and the research design. So by definition, we go a, a literature review. It is an assessment of a body of research that addresses a specific research question. 
or it is an organized written presentation or an account of what has been published on a topic by the research scholars uh, or uh, uh, or uh, any uh, scientists so what are the characteristics of a good uh, quality of the review of literature we go by point by point a good review of literature it should must be comprehensive uh, it should uh, give you the whole picture of your study that uh, you, you need to uh, doing and what has been uh, in the past has been done so it it should not leave any loopholes and it should include up to date references it means that you should also in, uh, include the recent studies or the uh, articles relating to your studies which has been published up to up to that date when you are creating the review of literature and it should be reproducible that uh, you have created a review of, of the studies uh, of, of, uh, for your study uh, for your protocol uh, then another person who is uh, looking at your review then he should find the same results uh, that is that has been pro uh, reported in the article it should not be that uh, something has been changed uh, that has been written in the published article and it should be free from the bias uh, it means that uh, it, it should not be having any publication bias or any uh, error uh, statistical errors uh, in, in the uh, effect sizes or something that you have reported and it should be uh, well written and it should be in the form of some of part its parts that i will be discussing in my uh, few uh, next slides and it should be clearly searched and selected that means that uh, for the review you, you should select uh, the databases such as the pubmed uh, oved embases for the uh, systematic reviews or the protocols or the original articles that has been published on the topics uh, on which you you would like to do the research so th that should be uh, specifically uh, referenced in your review of literature and then what are the different factors which affects the review of literature first is the researcher's background it is important that the researcher uh, who is uh, designing a study or who is doing the uh, systematic review he should be a uh, experienced uh, one on that field but it is uh, but there uh, but uh, it, it is also that they are the beginners who want to uh, uh, do the research on that topic which they they are they are not having any specific knowledge so it is based on the time they take to prepare the review of literature because they have to find the literature uh, and study it and create uh, create the review another is the complexity of the research project it is uh, easy to collect the review of literature for the simple and easy research projects than the complex one so uh, if your uh, uh, this research question it, it is something complex one that uh, there are some complex uh, studies you, you need to find so it will take some time and you have to uh, find out some uh, uh, complex or uh, good quality studies for your review of literatures then is the availability of the resources that is uh, uh, like internet facility uh, if you are having then it, it will be easy to search the databases quickly and find the literature and you can include in your uh, review of literature and uh, you have the journal subscription in your library from the uh, hard copies you can also uh, take the uh, literature so it depends upon the resources availability at your end third is the purpose that why are you creating this uh, 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 review of literature for your research first is that it helps to identify that has already been known about a research problem why because if uh, the answer is there for that research problem then why uh, you would be wasting your time or doing a uh, this uh, review of literature and uh, creating a, a research protocol or something and asking for the funding so it is important that first of all you comprehensively uh, find out the uh, in the literature that the uh, answer is there or not and it helps to build uh, on the previous knowledge that's important and that is uh, and then the many published research studies that contain the recommendation for the future research 
you you might have read the articles where at the end uh, in the discussion part they 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 have uh, given the recommendations what should be uh, done in the future uh, for for this research question and what has been uh, completed so it gives you a new idea so that's uh, that is also important that uh, you you do the review of literature and it also avoid the duplication uh, if it has been already been done and it saves your money and the time and it is necessary to narrow the problem that uh, uh, if it is if you, if your research question is uh, uh, through wide and you want to narrow it down so you find the review of literature and then you can uh, uh, refine it and make it clear that you want to uh, find uh, the effect of the, uh, the intervention you are studying and is the helps to understand the different ways of conducting the research study so uh, it also give you the idea by uh, studying the methodologies of the different uh, literature that has been published that how you can uh, manipulate uh, the methodology of your research study that you are proposing that which methodology would be more convenient to my research question so it will give you the different ideas to uh, do your study and it also helps to identify the comparative data so helps in interpretation and discussion of the previous studies then the sources from where you can uh, this write uh, this review of literature uh, one is the primary source and uh, next is the secondary source what is the primary source the these are the studies which has been written by the original researchers uh, such as the research article uh, the other original articles uh, in, uh, the rcts observational studies that has been published and some unpublished thesis or the dissertations they are also uh, there uh, which are in the different institutional library uh, libraries and you can access them uh, and you can uh, include them in your review of literature and they are also hand written records in the reports or the uh, case reports uh, uh, which has been there then are the secondary sources uh this second hand information uh, which can be extracted uh, from the newspapers or the book chapters or it could also be through the radio or the magazines and you simply google it so uh, these are the two sources from where you can uh, 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 take on and then uh, this is the these are the steps you follow in creating your review of literature first of all uh, you frame your question as, as uh, uh, that should be specific then is that you identify the databases and the <coughs> resources that i have already told that you have to search the specific uh, databases uh, such as pubmed ambes uh, for the uh, 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 you can extract the systematic reviews where uh, all the information is being given about your research question third is the search and refine uh you can then uh, 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 take only uh, those uh, articles or the papers which are of your importance because if you are searching the databases there could be thousands uh, of articles you, you have searched and you cannot uh, read all the articles so you have to refine them by uh, the filters there are different filters in the databases uh, which you can apply for the age for the uh, uh, for the uh, disease classification and their outcomes so you can uh, re refine uh, the search and then you can uh, read and analyze the specific extracted uh, uh, research articles from that you can extract the information and you can write your review so coming to the steps of the review of literature first of all uh, we have to uh, give the description of the condition or the health issue you are talking about Th second is the you have to describe uh, describe the intervention uh, intervention in detail uh, of which you you, uh, you want to do the rct or any observational study third is that the how that intervention will work you have to uh, 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 explain that uh, which are the previous studies that have explained that the, uh, these are the signaling pathways or this might be the Uh, uh intervention uh, working on the that receptor so you have to frame uh, do the framework and compile the uh, uh, previous study and uh, uh, give give the uh, uh, give the data 
and then is the importance of the study that why you want to do, uh, do this study what uh, uh, what is the rational and uh, how you hypothesize first comes to the description of the condition or the health issue so this will include the you have to uh, include the biology of that condition uh, that uh, you, you have to give uh, describe that how the disease is uh, if it is uh, asthma or something you are uh, doing the research so uh, on the uh, on the, so you have to give that how uh, this asthma is being caused so what are the different uh, cytokines or uh, uh, different uh, factors or environmental factors or genetic factors which are uh, causing this so you have to explain its uh, biology then is the diagnosis that uh, which are the criteria uh, are being used for the diagnosing the that condition such as the gina guidelines uh, used for the diagnosis of asthma so it could be any national or international guidelines so you have to quote them in your uh, review with uh, with specific references third is the uh, prognosis that uh, how this uh, this condition uh, uh, progress uh, with different staging and then is the prevalence or the incidence that is very important that uh, what is the prevalence of that disease uh, or the incidence uh, you want to study it, it could be worldwide or it could be uh, uh, nation specific if the if you're it depends upon your research question if you are doing uh, uh, it, it it's specifically then is the impact on affected people or the communities so what will be the impact of that disease on the uh, population you are studying so here's the uh, one example of uh, uh, of the background that is the heated humidified air for the common cold so here the common cold it uh, is the condition that we are uh, uh, discussing that is an acute self limiting viral infection of, of the upper respiratory tract involving the sneezing nasal congestion and the discharge sore throat cough low grade fever headache and the malaise and uh, the causative agent they are the different viruses that can cause the common cold uh, the most common of which are more than 100 serotypes so we have to give the reference at the end of the statement you are giving then the common cold and the other acute uh, respiratory infection account for about 40% of the employee absenteeism and about 30% of absenteeism from the school so this will uh, this you are giving some percentages that uh, how it, uh, it is affecting the population then the separate studies of families have shown that the average preschool child has 6 to 10 colds per year that is the incidence and the average adults has 2 to 4 colds per year so the, this you have to give with the reference and then the care for the people with the common cold imposes significant economic burden so that is the impact so this all comes in your description of the condition description of the intervention then you have to uh, give the uh, intervention that what the intervention consists of and the period and the frequency of its delivery so how uh, it is being uh, uh, given at what time interval and who is delivering it whether it is uh, some community worker or uh, some uh, hospital worker so then the describe the its pharmacology and you have to describe its uh, dosage at what uh, dosage uh, it, it's been given then uh, how it metabol it, it metabolized and then the selective effects then its half life duration then how it interacts with the other drugs uh, when it is being given and other and then the known adverse effects so these all comes in the description of the intervention so this is a, the example we are following where uh, there are the different antihistamines decongestants intranasal uh, entropopium bromide vitamin c interferon these are all being given for this uh, common cold uh, and uh, we are uh, uh, giving here the intervention that there is a heated humidified air that is the inhaling warm damp air that is uh, thought to offer the uh, relief from the uh, symptoms of the uh, common cold so uh, the, uh, so you have to describe about the, all the interventions 
then the how the intervention might work here you have to give the theoretical reasoning and the empirical evidence to support that how this intervention works and it should be with the referencing and a logical mo model for the complex intervention should be given and how the mechanism of action it affects then is the how the intervention is expected to differ from or added to the standard or alternative interventions so it should be reported in the how the intervention might work so here we can see that the uh, this uh, heated humidifier uh, it acts on the uh, by raising the mucosal temperature to 43 degree temperature for uh, uh, three 30 minute period it can block the uh, rhinoviral replication and stop the common cold and studies uh, of the effect of heated humidifier air uh, also suggested that raising the nasal mucosal temperature may inhibit the rhinoviral replication and the device it uh, used to raise the nasal mucosal temperature it is a rhinotherm it has been used so uh, and it has been claimed that the 80% of the part participants who use the rhinotherm in the early stages of the common cold felt better the next day so this is all about your intervention of the previous uh, uh, with the pre uh, previous studies being uh, reported uh, you have to give in the how the intervention might work then what is the importance of the study you should give a brief statement that uh, gives a rational highlighting why are you doing a study that determine whether a new treatment option is effective whether this uh, heated humidified air is effective than the other uh, options and determine whether it is more effective than the other options for better for uh, some of the particular outcomes or for some side effects and it will uh, settle the uncertainty or inconsistency of practice between different treatment options and determine that what choice people are making about this intervention so uh, this is the uh, why uh, you are doing uh, and then uh, when uh, you are writing about the intervention it should not be very uh, lengthy descriptions on the mechanism of action and it should be relevant to your topic and uh, uh, if, if it is clinical or something you, uh, you you can have some animal model but avoid of using the animal research and what is the uh, uh, how the method section uh, is being taken uh, after uh, doing your uh, this uh, uh, review of literature then you have to plan your task that how you will be uh, doing your study uh, which will be uh, by different subheadings and it should be in a uh, detail and it should be replicable uh, my method subsection should includes the eligibility criteria uh, where you will define that which participants uh, of which age group of which settings will be included in the study and with whom you will exclude so it should be reported and the and the study design is important that whether it would be a, a experimental study design or it would be an observational if, if it is an rct it you will can do it as a experimental then if it is case control you can include it in the observational then the outcomes you plan to report on so uh, you can a priori uh, uh, give your outcomes in the methodology that you will be looking for and how you will collect the data from your studies for possible outcomes so uh, what methodology you will be uh, uh, doing if you are screening for a particular uh, disease then which screening instruments you will be using and uh, so the, if you are designing some experiment then what experiment you will be doing so how uh, you will collect your analysis of the data, uh, of the results you have to report how will you interpret your findings considering the uh, quality of your uh, evidence or the results and how will you summarize the findings and finally how will you decide whether and how to in, uh, if you are including some uh, econ economic analysis in your research so if uh, the system you are doing some systematic reviews then uh, you have to write a research prot prot protocol in a manner that you anticipate the sufficient amount of studies in your systematic reviews and uh, uh, there are uh, uh, if there are no published studies that uh, then don't stop uh, or change the protocol of the eligibility criteria of the of your protocol uh, you might uh, find more studies in uh, future or uh, in the future update 
and don't exclude studies unnecessary on the basis of their language and the publication status in the systematic review if you are doing then the factors to consider when uh, developing the criteria for types of the participants so uh, these are based uh, on the disease condition uh, uh, you are looking uh, for and what are the most important characteristics that describe these pe uh, people or the participants and uh, you have to give their uh, uh, demographic factors their age their gender their ethnicity and what is the uh, setting by whether you are including it from the hospital or uh, co community and uh, who will be making the uh, diagnosis and are there other types of people who should be excluded from the review and how will studies in uh, involving only a subset of relevant participants be handled so these all be uh, defined if, if uh, in the types of the participants and uh, while selecting your population it depends upon your research question whether uh, which type of population you will be including whether it will be a narrow population uh, you uh, if you you will be doing some specific patient of interest such as in case of the uh, 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 cancer uh, you are uh, having some research problem on the cancer then you are taking some uh, patients which, who are being uh, psychologically uh, uh, diagnosed for a specific cancer so you have, will have some narrow population and uh, you, you will be broadening the population if you are looking for the uh, cancer with the, any uh, different pains or uh, which is affecting uh, different organs so it you can uh, broaden the population and you can also have a age age range then uh, if you are looking for the population based then it will be a large uh, having the large uh, patient of interest where you can have some uh, such a screening uh, for cancer, cancers in the population. So it, it depends upon your research query that what type of research question you are doing. And there could be some mixed pop, uh, populations where uh, there might be uh, adults and the children. So you have to select that to which you, you will be taking that, whether you are uh, taking the children or the adults in your study. Then there uh, are the equity and the spatial population that uh, uh, the findings of their of your research uh, will be gen gen generalized and will be uh, used worldwide. So it is important that uh, the population uh, should have the uh, uh, you you choose that population that uh, the, uh, for the disease uh, that that is more prevalent and the pro prognosis is there. And such as the uh, for low middle income country, th that uh, sore throat is more prevalent, and uh, antibiotics are being given uh, in that condition. But for the high middle income country, the prevalence of this uh, disease is very less, and uh, you are not giving uh, any antibiotics. So it, it depends upon the cho uh, cho choice of your population and different effects of the safety. And it also depends uh, that uh, if you are giving some. Uh, uh interventions uh, uh educational interventions which are depending upon different languages or cu culturally so uh, it also uh, uh, depends that which population you have to select and it also depends on the on the importance of the outcomes that uh, if you are uh, looking on the development of milestones and attendance in the ch children then you, uh, you you have mostly to incorporate the children in your study Uh, this is another example uh, that there are the three sets of the population uh, for the cancer related pain. Uh, you, wonder, uh, you want to see the, uh, which intervention might work better or worse uh, in patients with the cancer related bone pain than in the pa patients with cancer induced pain in other parts of the body. So there are the three sets of the population uh, where uh, first in, in, in first there is that uh, you have to limit the eligible uh, population only to the patient with the cancer induced uh, bone pain. Second is the uh, you are conducting uh, your studies uh, separately for the patients with cancer induced uh, pain in bones and in other body parts. Third is to include the patients with all types of the cancer pain, but plan to compare the difference between the two groups. So out of three, which population uh, you will uh, select for your uh, questions uh, when you would like to see the effect of the intervention on the cancer related pain. 
So uh, the answer would be the third one, which will include the patient with all type of the cancer pain, but you plan to compare the differences between the two groups. That is with the cancer related bone pain and with the cancer induced pain in other parts of the body. Then uh, when you are uh, looking at the interventions uh, and they are uh, uh, given in the combined format, so you should be very clear and informative. And there may be a lot of variation in the literature uh, when you are writing the review that uh, about, the inter in the, about the combined intervention where th th this uh, which could create a bias or confounding effects. And you should be clear which components and the combinations of the interventions you should include uh, in your study. Uh, this is an example that is the combined pharmacotherapy and behavior intervention for uh, smoking uh, uh, cessation. Here uh, you can see that uh, uh, they have given the pharmacotherapy and they, they are also given the behavior intervention for the smoking cessation. So here uh, uh, in this uh, systematic review, they have uh, taken out the two outcomes that is the cessation at longest follow-up you can uh, or uh, at, that is at the six months and cessation at the longest follow-up at the 12 months. So here you can see that at what, what is the effect at the six months and what is the effect at the 12 months. Uh, and uh, you can see that uh, the RR is uh, more at the six months as compared to the uh, six months. So it's uh, up to you that the time duration of your outcome, you have to set a priority that uh, you want to see and what uh, combined therapies uh, you are comparing. So what outcomes to report? So th that is also important. Uh, you should uh, plan a priority to report the outcomes of importance of your research question and cho choose the standard outcomes which are there about uh, the, uh, the morbidity, mortality or uh, their prognosis. So always include the possible adverse effects which are very important uh, in case of the RCTs if you are conducting. And you also indicate the minimally important differences. Then outcomes that might be particularly conceptually uh, depending on the type of medical test. Uh, these are the clinical management, uh, direct health effects. Another is the emotional, social, cognitive, behavioral responses. Then are the legal and the ethical effects. And then is the cost. So these all depend upon the type of the tests or the intervention uh, or, or the uh, study design uh, of your uh, protocol. Uh, if it is a screening test, uh, then uh, it would be the you will be looking for the emotional, social, cognitive, behavioral responses more. And if it uh, comes to the clinical management, uh, the, then the, in the diagnostic test, uh, you will frame the outcomes. And for the legal and ethical, you could have the screening test and the diagnostics test. So it depends upon your uh, type of the uh, uh, study design, which you are uh, creating. Then when and how the outcomes they are being measured, they, uh, as I have already said, it could be short uh, term or the long term outcomes. Uh, and you can compare that uh, where the effect size comes more and uh, you have to pre-specify them. Then how to measure your outcomes, check for the any validated or published measurement instruments. That is very important in case of the uh, sc uh, screening when you are doing. So uh, the tools used for the screening, it should be validated and standardized uh, that are being used using and the measures are, uh, you are using in your measurement, such as uh, you are uh, measuring for some uh, uh, obesity. So you, uh, your measures will be uh, uh, BMI, weight, and uh, waist circumference. So you have to give the priority for your measures uh, in that, and you have to check that uh, what uh, in which uh, validated uh, instruments or something uh, you are using to measure it, and check your uh, rational that uh, sophisticated uh, high, uh, if. If there is some technology or the test you are comparing with uh, uh, another test, so you have to take care that uh, whether the test is uh, one year uh, uh, ago uh, ago it has been launched or it is uh, it has been validated uh, 
10 years ago because this you you, you have to see about the findings of the studies that uh, about its sensitivity specificity its accuracy so that depends upon your <coughs> rational and then you plan your measures <coughs> choose your measures reported more commonly across your included studies <coughs> so for the outcomes you have to plan your all the measures accordingly and you have to give the priority and then uh, the outcomes uh, could be uh, primary and the secondary that prime in the primary you can list the main outcomes uh, of uh, study and the, in the secondary such as the adverse effects and the other outcomes you would like to uh, list because uh, uh, when you, uh, you are uh, giving some plain language summary or you are uh, of your study or you uh, you, uh, you are giving some uh, summary of findings then uh, of the effect size so it's important that uh, you list the primary outcomes there so these are all uh, things you need to uh, do in your uh, uh, review of literature and uh, when writing your uh, research protocol and uh, writing your methodology thanks thank you so much sir for the very informative talk on uh, how to write a background. Uh, I would now request all the participants to kindly unmute themselves and ask any doubts that they have, or they can even write in the chat box. Sir, I have a question mm -hmm. that in this scenario of COVID-19, where mm -hmm. everything is ever evolving mm -hmm. and all kind of literature is changing. Mm -hmm. So when we write a, a project or a protocol mm -hmm. for something related an intervention related to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So once we have written, there's a probability that during the study period, mm -hmm. some of the literature changes. Mm -hmm. So what should we do in that case scenario? Uh, actually, in case of the COVID-19, uh, daily you will find that uh, some of the new studies are being uh, published. And you will find that you would you are planning to do some research on that topic, and next day you will find that reported and that the outcome is there. So I think uh, in in this case of pandemic, the study design. Kindly <laughs> mute themselves. So. The research question framed, uh, framed in this uh, uh, scenario of the pandemic, uh, I think these are based on uh, on the basis of the data that has been previously published in the one year. And, and it has been the modeling has been done that in the next six months or in the next one year, what could be the change in the mutation of the virus or what could be the change in the uh, uh, in uh, in uh, morbidity, mortality index or something else in the uh, in the community. So these are all based on the um, uh, modeling effects that the research questions are being framed because now uh, you are writing a research proposal and it will take something two months or three months to pass out from the institute for having the ethical clearance, then you will do in the study and it will take a year uh, and before an year you will have the outcome. So it is not easy to write a, a protocol or research study on the pandemic that is being uh, changing uh, very frequently. So, okay, thank you, sir. And so, what is the difference if we do something which is intervention based and something if it's a diagnostic test? Like, if we have to write a project which is centered on a diagnostic test, then how will the PICO variate? Uh, in the case of the diagnostic test, uh, you have to compare the index test with the uh, uh, this uh, gold standard one. So the, the studied uh, uh, design is uh, also uh, the, this uh, expert uh, that is based on intervention only, but you are comparing there the in, uh, index test with the gold standard. And there are different, uh, uh, you have to analyze for the sensitivity, specificity, and uh, the accuracy, PP, uh, uh, ROC curve, that they are the outcomes that you have to list. So there's one more question in the chat box that how important is performing a preliminary research before formulating a question? Yeah, that's also important. You can do a pilot 
study before before doing uh, writing a big uh, project uh, you could have a, a pilot study on a small sample size of uh, in your institute taking sun and you can see for the what is, what was the trend of the outcomes uh, you, uh, you you are taking in your study if 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 it is in that you are looking uh, the effect sizes of that intervention has a uh, more impact so then you can uh, formulate the research question on a larger basis on a larger study and uh, you can uh, see the preliminary research that uh, the outcomes of the preliminary research for formulating a big study and sir how extensive should be the searching while writing a review of literature ha huh, that is important that it should be very comprehensive uh, it should be specific because the review in review of literature when you are writing if you miss some of the studies or uh, one of uh, most important studies where they uh, where the outcome of your interest has been reported in that study and you have missed out it then after doing the whole thing at the end you find that uh, uh the outcome has uh, been there so it, it will be a waste of time but you have to just uh, change your eligibility criteria or something your outcomes then so it is important that uh, up to date uh, the uh, you have to uh, do a specific search and it should be done by a librarian okay sir sir uh, i have a question uh, like if we have uh, we are planning of uh, designing a systematic review study on uh, on some uh, you know basic uh, science topic so mm -hmm. if the study the same uh, like the systematic review has been done few years back but now the data is available a lot more data has produced mm -hmm. so what are the points that has to be taken in consideration while uh, you know designing again a systematic review updated systematic review kindly comment the tips uh, okay it depends upon the if uh, if you are doing a cochrane systematic review it uh, it is uh, it already get got updated after 3 years and if you are doing a non cochrane review then you have to do a new systematic review with your new objective and your outcomes and uh, if it has been 3 years there might be more studies and now the trend is of the living systematic review which is uh, uh, which is coming and most of the living systematic reviews are being doing and which are being uh, updated every week for the new evidence and uh, outcomes they are being reported thank you sir uh, i have a question one more question sir that uh, in picot how important is the time in it and how can we see like can we define that the literature should be searched or written in a particular time frame or it should be all the available data uh, it uh, depends upon your uh, study outcomes that what uh, outcomes you are looking if it is time trend analysis you are looking uh, uh, some surveys for pre pre prevalence of the studies such you are looking uh, you have to look for the uh, different time periods such as you are looking 10 years gap you, uh, you are looking that the prevalence was that uh, before 2000 and now uh, in the 20 years what the prevalence has been changed so the time period is very important uh, in most of the study designs and in intervention studies it is also important okay sir thank you sir the another question is Okay, so that's it. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, they can either unmute themselves or write it up in the chat box. So, can case reports be also considered whenever writing a review of literature, or do they should be a particular study designs or particular type of literature that should be considered? uh if uh, the data pertaining to your objective or outcome is not there and there are only the case reports available so you can write the case reports there is a recent systematic review you know in covid in the cardiomyelitis where the 14 case reports has been uh, reported uh, of their mris so uh, you can write the case reports in your review do we have some checklist sir in writing a review or writing a basically a protocol um uh, there are checklist uh, it uh, actually uh, if you are writing a systematic uh, these are the things 
these are uh, relating to systematic reviews and these are relating to systematic reviews uh, and uh, the study designs and uh, uh, okay, okay. <laughs> i thought we'll take up some of the questions which are coming and uh, as we uh, we know dr anil has also told you about the methodology for systematic review we are talking of review of literature which is otherwise done in a very traditional manner but uh, these days uh, many research agencies are asking for a systematic review which has already been done on that particular topic and then you refine your research question based on the findings of that systematic review so even if you have taken up a research question you can first do your review of literature systematically following a proper protocol doing all extensive searches and then coming out with some refinement of your research question so if you have any questions please ask you can either unmute yourself or even write in the chat box yes dr minakshi has asked how important is performing a preliminary research before formulating a question i think this is also very important and research agencies will actually give you a lot of uh, preference if you've already done some preliminary work on the research question that you are writing your project upon because if you have sometimes you know that means that you have standardized your methodology you have some idea of operational uh, research you know uh, you have an idea of what all will be required for that particular research question and then you if you are already published in that particular field that is something which is many times required by the research agencies for somebody to become a principal investigator in a particular project so dr minakshi it's important to perform some preliminary research before formulating a question and publish that research because as you know these days i mean you cannot be recognized unless you are published in that particular field and these days publication is not very difficult there are so many journals good quality journals in which you can uh, send your reviews or systematic reviews for publication why we are stressing on systematic review during a background uh, search of literature is that that itself gives you one publication and if your proposal is written well if your research proposal is written well then these days even a research protocol gets uh, can be published so that uh, and there are various sites on which your research protocol can be published and many journals who publish research protocols okay so dr sara is asking in doing a review of literature what type of studies should be considered so review of literature means you have to go through all the studies and go for the most recent ones which are directly related to your research question there is no point in wasting your time on studies which do not relate to your question or are not relevant to the current times so it's very important that you go through but sometimes you know even old studies they give you good ideas and in between sometimes the research has stopped uh, you know the researcher has stopped pursuing that particular uh, line of action which later on becomes very important so the type of studies means all type of studies you should uh, also look for systematic reviews because if somebody has already done an extensive uh, review on a particular topic then that will give you all the cross references which you can uh, again read for primary studies uh, do we have any other questions you can type your question in the chat box uh, if you don't have any questions i have some questions for you uh, i would like you to uh, tell us what are the research questions which you have thought about Dr. Mandeep has asked what strategies we can follow not to miss any study on our research question. Uh, that is, uh, if you uh, type in your research search strategy in PubMed or other databases, 
which are based on PICO. So that is why we ask you to formulate a PICO that is population intervention, uh, comparator and outcomes. The key terms, you know, the key words which you use in your searches should come from these four items. And then there is a less chance that you will miss any of the studies which have been there. For systematic reviews and uh, randomized controlled trials, there is another search on uh, PubMed itself, which is clinical queries. And on that, you can actually find if there are any already existing systematic reviews or meta-analysis on that particular problem. And even randomized controlled trials, you can find them. And you can also find the gene genomic databases on uh, clinical queries. So this is something which helps you in making your search more comprehensive. And another thing you can do is that don't restrict yourself to one database. It should not be just PubMed. You can go to MBase, you can go to Web of Science, you can go to Ovid, and you can also look at the Cochrane Library so that you can find whatever has been published before. It is already there. Another question is, is there any criteria regarding minimum number of databases are required to be searched for a systematic review? Yes, at least two or three you should have searched. You should not just restrict to one. Uh, that is why in most of the methodologies, you write that at least two or three databases like PubMed, MBase, and Cochrane Library you should have searched uh, before you, you know, form, finalize your search question. So have you all written your research questions? I would like to ask uh, some of you, uh, Dr. Nurain Alam, have you written your uh, research question? Would you like to tell us what is your question for a research proposal? Uh, Dr. Alam, I would request you to kindly unmute yourself or write it in the chat box. Any question, any research question that you have thought of? Uh, there is Dr. Pradeepta Ray. Uh, would you like to say anything on this? Have you thought of any question? Uh, please unmute yourself. You have to. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I thought of one research question. Actually, I am going to perform. That okay. is it. Under differentiation in first solar sum brain. Uh, You're not very clear actually. Are you speaking from one uh, device? Yes, uh, I, uh, I am going to perform one research planning. That is, is there any gender differentiation in corpus callosum of brain? Okay, okay. What is your background? Uh, which speciality you belong to? Anatomy? Anatomy, yes, ma'am. Okay. So, you want to see if there are any differences in different, uh, in uh, two genders? In corpus callosum. Uh, so, what is the background of this particular question? Uh, how did you come, uh, you know, come to think of this? Neuroanatomy. So there is a difference, otherwise, is there any difference Everyone to kindly mute themselves. Yes, ma'am. So there is something uh, already described. Dr. Devashish Ray, yeah, yeah, I think he is uh, the one who is clapping. Yes, yes, ma'am. Can you please mute yourself, sir? Devashish, can you mute yourself? Yes. Hello. Yes, yes. Uh, so, did you look? So, you know, the next thing you should do is uh, what is the importance of this particular question? 
Do you think um, that leads to any difference in neurological response of uh, you know a, a male and a female uh, yeah. if the corpus callosum is uh, you know differently uh, anatomically different? Actually, uh, corpus callosum form one of the uh, uh, wall or boundary of the ventricle. Mm-hmm. So, if there is any differentiation, then there may be ventricular such differentiation may be there, which may be related to any uh, disease condition. Uh, that is the aim, actually. Okay. Okay, that is an interesting topic. I don't know whether anything has been done on this particular topic. You can... Have you uh, thought of any agency which would like to fund you or uh, do you carry out some anatomical, you know, study? I am just planning, planning to perform the research. Uh, mm-hmm. Is my uh, research question is right? I think it is right. So, if you want to split it into a PICO, what would it be? What is the population you want to study? Uh, actually, I want to study include the not the children population uh, above eighteen years right. population, not below the eighteen years, uh, eighteen yes. to uh, up to eighty years. Uh, want to see the gender in dif- any differentiation in the uh, different uh, uh, diameters of. Corpus callosum in the uh, the brain. I will want to uh, procure from uh, uh, cadavers uh, okay. or from the department, uh, also from the anatomy department. Uh, that is the I am planning to perform. See, there are two different ways in which you can do it. One is that you look at the anatomical specimen. For yeah. that, you will need at least, you know, whatever is your sample size, say, if you want to study 100 infants, you would need at least 100 brains to study of different sex, uh, you know, of both sexes. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, for otherwise, you can also do it radiologically. So, have you been practicing radiological anatomy that by doing the CT or MRI, you can find any differences? in the male and female corpus callosum. In that case, you know, you need to uh, collaborate with a radiologist and uh, you can carry, or maybe one arm of your study could be anatomical, doing it yourself on anatomical specimen. And the other arm could be doing it with the radiology and then trying to see if you can validate your findings. Or this, these studies can even be one after another. So, how many you you have access to? How many anatomical samples? Uh, actually, till now I access to uh, ten cadavers in uh, from the forensic and the uh, okay. uh, my department, anatomy department. Okay. And uh, till now uh, I uh, fail to find any differentiation. But I think if I include more and more uh, cases, uh, actually more from the radiology also, mm. then I may find any differentiation, I think. Yes, I think it would be, that is a more physiological approach because getting cadavers is not very easy. Uh, but yeah, I guess yeah. in anatomy, when you are doing it for students, for example, you know, you know you're in a medical college? Which medical college you are working in? Uh, Silchar Medical College from Silchar. So, like, you know, how many students uh, do you have when you are in anatomy dissection hall? How many cadavers do you have for? We have uh, four cadavers. Uh, we have actually 100 students and uh, now for uh, that uh, EWS seat 25, that is 125 students each year. Okay. Okay, okay. So you have to teach four on four cadavers. You have to teach hundred and twenty students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is you know in our times we used to have like that is one only for four students. Donated bodies. We right. are running out of bodies actually. That right. is the most. That is the problem. So I think is that problem. is uh, one reason why you should go for uh, you know radiological anatomy, radiological neuroanatomy. Yeah, yeah. I also uh, talked with the HOD also, my mm-hmm. college. Yeah. And because, you know, your, your 10 patients, if you have already have 10 subjects and you have 10 brains in which you have uh, found some differences. In that case, uh, if you have picked up, because that is hard observation which you would have. 
so mm-hmm. if you can uh, correlate that thing with radiological study later on this will be a useful product for us okay you are right ma'am so because it is difficult to have a very large sample size on anatomical uh, kind of specimen so yeah. but for ct scans which are done you know every day in radiology you must be doing uh, you know 10 or uh, 20 at least ct scans or mris and then you can collaborate with your uh, radiological colleague and then see if you find any differences so that is why you know somebody was saying there is any point in doing preliminary work so this particular work which you have already done is your preliminary work and then you can build up on this and uh, uh, write a detailed research plan yes, yes. very important aspect i think uh, we have discussed in this particular so what will be, so there will be you know this is you you should review literature and in your review of literature have you found that there are any differences between yeah, yeah. Some, some of the literatures they have the differentiation and some literatures still to find any differentiation actually they okay. are uh, controversies are there but uh, right. according to some authors there are some differentiation according to some authors there are uh or some no differentiation so obviously if the question is the answer to this particular question is not very well known then there is a point in doing a systematic study on this so but i would suggest that you collaborate with a radiologist colleague so that you can uh, you know standardize your methodology for doing it but you can certainly then increase your sample size because yeah. uh, you know sometimes there are variations there are normal anatomical variations which may be there and which may not be sex related uh, in a particular yes. population so anybody else would like to share thank you thank you dr pradeepta for sharing your question and we would certainly like to put you in touch with the with our anatomy department and if you would like to take any help from uh, eji regarding that we will be very very happy to do that Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. We have one question in the chat box that how can we select the recent and the most important clinical problems? See, this is something for which you have to uh, be oriented. You know, in your current times, you have to keep pace with the what is getting published in the recent journals. so that is the way to uh, do it you know the more recent articles of your particular area of interest if you look at them then obviously you will be uh, you know oriented to the recent uh, findings in that particular field so you have to first identify your field and then go for a literature search and the most recent articles will actually tell you what is happening in that uh, particular field uh, in the recent times so uh, so that is how we will select the more most uh, recent uh, so being from research background we have inadequate data about clinical problems Idea. yeah that's right but you know these days we are living in the age of translational research in which basic sciences are always guiding the clinical sciences so it's always good to collaborate with uh, some clinician who can help you uh you know relate your basic research findings to the clinical problems and that's why we should always have a research team in which there is a basic scientist there may be a clinician over there so you know it is no point doing your research in one single you know uh, sp- space where you are not collaborating with anybody else and you then you're not able to actually enunciate your uh, relevance of your research findings so it's always good to discuss your findings in the in a wider audience that is why people present their findings in the conferences before they get published and but it's extremely important that our research groups have you know a research team should have a clinician should have a basic scientist it should also have a methodologist like a statistician who can guide you about the basic fundamentals of uh, you know research any more questions anybody i think if there are no questions the next session is at 12 o'clock yes we can have a break of yes, 15 yes. minutes so we will now have a break of 15 minutes
so you can have uh, tea or coffee or whatever water whatever you want and you will join again at 12 noon uh, when we have our session on uh, ethics uh, in a research protocol so see you uh, later then thank you very much thank you ma'am thank you sir for the very interesting and a brief talk about how to begin with i'm sure as the workshop progresses we'll have a better idea on how to develop the research protocol. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you. In the now we have to identify
हेलो डॉक्टर समीर हेलो डॉक्टर मीनू हाँ जी नाइस टू हैव यू so we have some 26 participants who are already logged in although they were earlier there were more so we had given them a 10 minutes break so they'll be joining back uh, but in any case uh, this whole recording is will be there on youtube so that people who are not able to join right now they can uh, listen to the talk later on also okay okay that's great so so should i uh, should i uh, should we start yes i am ready okay so good afternoon everyone we have uh, professor samir malhotra with us uh, he is the professor and head of clinical pharmacology department of pgi uh, he is a very avid researcher and has done a lot of primary research as well as uh he is very adept in doing systematic reviews and he is a co investigator with us on the icmr advanced center for evidence based child health as well as for our cochrane affiliate and uh, uh he will be talking he is actually convener of our uh, ethics committee of pgimer for the extramural projects so uh he will be speaking on ethical aspects of a research proposal so dr samir malhotra now the floor is yours thank you dr meenu the the background of these uh, uh, delegates is basically or all, all are yes. medical people no uh, all are not uh, doctors they are also researchers and phd students but they are more, they are all medical background Mm-hmm. but not all of them are uh, physicians but many of them are faculty colleagues from different medical colleges and also from pgi and uh, uh, we have uh, other people who are working in other areas uh, such as we had from silchar medical college we have from pgi chandigarh so from pgi we have more more number of people as of now okay yeah. uh let me start with this uh, you know ethics is a subject that we deal with you know every day in our lives even several times in a day you see at each step we need to take some decisions and ethical considerations become part of that decision making process most of the time we do it unknowingly unconsciously uh but these decisions are always uh, you know occurring all the time whenever there are choices to be made an ethical uh, you know a decision will have to be made which is uh, which has ethical components you know uh, recently you know all of you are aware of you know the second wave of covid when we had to when, when suddenly so many patients came and we had to you know restrict medical care to patients because uh, you know this you know in many countries in europe this happened happened even in the first wave of pandemic like in italy where patients had to be triaged or prioritized we will we'll t- treat these patients we will let these patients go home to die i mean such horrible decisions had to be taken which you know you do not wish for anyone uh, to take such a decision but these decisions had to be taken because what we were told we you know we studied we read there were many papers on, only on this topic that were published in some of the highest you know biggest most uh, impactful journals about ethics of resource allocation and you know prioritizing patients uh, we were told because resources are inadequate there are uh, inadequate facilities infrastructure manpower and so on you know so so there are two parts of this uh, the argument that i am making the one part of the argument is in the decision making process that okay we have to take this decision uh, what should be the uh, you know background information that we need to make such a decision what should be our points of uh, you know concern or points of based on which we will take the decision should it be young versus 
a old that is age should it be based on first come first served and so on but it's the second part of the question that is lack of availability of adequate resources that uh, that is a question that should worry you that should worry uh, all of us you know this we live in times in you know these are times in the whole of human civilization where the society's wealth is enormous many papers have shown that the with the current available wealth all over the world it is possible to have enough for everyone practically on the planet keeping even keeping in mind the huge population growth that has occurred in the past even then there is adequate for everyone provided these the divisions can be reduced among the top few 0.1% or 0.01% of people and the rest of the people but those divisions we are unable to tackle we are increasingly more or less forced to utilize more resources on other things or you know forced to uh, prioritize private health care rather than a state based national health care system um, i am not talking of india i am talking all over the world you know these policies have been with us for the last 30 to 40 years it, they started in the 1970s went up to 1980s and since then there has been a systematic plan to defund the government sector and in, increase the private sector this defunding of government sector has occurred that started in the developed countries especially the us and has continued since then in the past couple of decades it has you know accelerated this thing so when we say you know we don't did not have adequate facilities what we mean is that there there was you know for such facilities to occur it is very very clear that if we need to develop such facilities that could you know take care of large proportion of population that fall suddenly ill uh, we need to have some resources which will not make profit for others so this focus that shifted from a human agenda to a profit based agenda since the 70s and 1970s and 80s has uh, given rise to this situation and most of the economists in the world who were earlier you know who were very much for free market societies and you know privatization are increasingly seeing now and saying now that there has to be a limit to that kind of free market uh, privatized system especially in healthcare because the the consequences of that we have seen in the in this uh, you know a pandemic but you know uh, this is uh, although this is a topic of great interest to me and has huge implications for ethics i am not going to go into more details of this topic but i'll try to finish in say less around 30 minutes so that we have sufficient time for question answer and discussion which in during which it is you know usually the best points of the session come out in those few minutes of discussion okay so what i am going to restrict myself although with first a lot of difficulty is i will restrict myself to only to the ethical considerations in research especially when you are writing your research protocol now uh, coming back to that example of you know having to prioritize patients based on uh, some parameter you know what is our aim our aim is that we should maximize the the benefit for the society like you know there were some uh, countries in which elderly patients were not provided care because they said that we will provide to the younger population because it will be more beneficial to the society now you can have problems with this argument but this is not a new argument this argument has been with us especially this was you know uh, you know formulated very clearly by one philosopher called 
Jeremy Bentham, uh, a British philosopher, which was followed up or modified uh, a little by uh, another philosopher called John Stuart Mill. The theory they called it is consequentialism. That means the consequences of our actions are important. If the consequences are such that they maximize the benefits for the largest number of people, we should follow those actions. Okay. Now, if you look at the ancient civilizations, including Indian civilization, Greek civilization, Egyptian, and so on, you will find that in their texts, uh, mythological texts, religious texts, such questions have been debated. So you see, for ever since uh, humanity, uh, you know, we can call ourselves the Homo sapiens that appeared. These questions must have been debated on how to deal with you know, difficult situations when there are two choices to be made, which choice to make, and more importantly, why that choice is made. And then, you know, documenting the reasons for future generations to come. But when you stop a little bit, you know, you pause a little and think about this consequentialist theory, consequentialism, which is also called utilitarianism, that is, increases the utility of the maximum number of people you will see that you know there are some drawbacks in this theory that that we only take care of the consequences of our action so these drawbacks if you think about them lead you to the other theory of ethics which is called deontology which was d e o and t o l o g y deontology which was given by a german philosopher by the name of kant immanuel kant now According to this theory, what is most important is our action, the act, what, what we are doing. So in, in our research, both these theories are extremely important. You see, when we say actions are important, that is how we deal, our, deal with our research patients, the research participants. You know, they, they become very important to us, these, both of these theories when as a clinical pharmacologist when we do phase one trials in healthy volunteers we have a new drug which has never been tested in patients we test it for the first time in uh, you know humans they are called first in human studies that the first for the first time we give something to a healthy human being we don't know what can happen so you know it is such type of uh, you know uh, things such type of research that makes you think that forces you to think about these theories. Okay, how should our acts be? What will be the consequences of those actions? But you can see that if you again think about both these theories, you will see there is still something lacking. And that something was lacking was even known at the time of Aristotle, who had come up with this theory of virtue ethics which was that it's not the actions or the consequences that are important. It's the person who is doing those actions. If that person is moral, then that person's actions will be ethical. So this kind of you know debate between these three main theories, there are other theories, I'm not going to go into that. But these three theories, there, there has been a lot of interesting discussions and debates around these theories. And if you remember the results of these theories, especially after the Second World War, you know, you most of you will remember reading about the atrocities Nazis committed on uh, prisoners of war, especially Jews, and the subsequent trials in Nuremberg, in which even doctors were indicted, doctors who were doing experiments on human beings, extremely unethical experiments. Uh, these trials are collectively called doctor's trials, and a lot of doctors were given punishment as a result of those trials. This even led to a very important document in the history of ethics that's called the Nuremberg Code, which was followed by the Declaration of Helsinki, again, a vital document. These Doctors' trials, you know, it's very interesting that we always talk about these trials, these uh, German trials about German atrocities. 
we have hardly spoken about similar atrocities committed by the japanese on their prisoners of war which were mainly uh, you know the sufferers were asian countries that japan had occupied so there were separate japanese trials you know why i'm stressing on this point is that we traditionally view japan as a peaceful spiritual country you know with extreme uh, spirituality we think abundant in their nature but that was that is not so even they committed a lot of atrocities so you see all these theories these atrocities were committed in the name of their nations their actions their consequences you know everything you you can see in those theories then around 1964 there came a very very important paper a landmark paper in the history of medical ethics that is by the uh, author was henry beecher an anesthetist who wrote in the nigm that you know he spoke about a lot of unethical studies that were going on in the us at the time they were prosecuting the germans for unethical research uh, you know on their subject the paper pointed out that us itself is a culprit in many instances and he gave many many examples of those unethical studies in between uh, you know towards 1970s it became a very another very interesting and important event occurred which is called the tuskegee syphilis study in which uh, black african uh, americans were followed with syphilis were followed up for decades without administering any treatment even when penicillin became available so the experiment started before penicillin was available but continued till the 17th if you remember a us president had to publicly apologize for that research so called quote and quote research so no as a result of all these events what happened was that in most countries ethics committees were formed in pj also we had our ethics committee very very early when the institute uh, you know uh, started it was amongst the earliest ethics committees in the world and many other countries many most of the institutions they started to develop their own ethics committees and these ethics committees they had these you know uh, theories to look at they had to view at the projects in totality whether it's ethical or not what will be the you know harms to the subject to the society what are the possible risks and hazards so these ethics committees slowly and slowly started to become efficient and i would say they perhaps crossed a line and became over efficient and you know so much so that they started to be called as obstacles to research then paper started to emerge that you know ethics committees delay projects they unnecessarily delay which causes a lot of harm even today you will see such papers being published so this whole thing was becoming very challenging and the final event in the history of ethics that occurred was what is known as the belmont report b e l m o n t it's a us document came in 1979 which i would say totally overhauled the picture of ethics what was the contribution of the belmont report the belmont report said okay there are those theories they are very important you look at those projects okay ethical or not ethical but let us try another approach let us make some principles which are related to those theories and if those principles are being are not being violated we will call the project ethical so those principles most of you will know justice autonomy beneficence non maleficence all of, you know the common principles that we know so three main principles justice autonomy and beneficence so justice is equal opportunity to all equal uh, uh, access to research for all autonomy is patient decision making capacity not to be research not to be done without consent 
beneficence means you know benefit to the person or to the society so these principles and a set of other principles which icmr also followed and icmr gave a set of principles so i mean it's now what i am going to say now is more of my opinion uh, and you perhaps will not see it in textbooks or you know journal articles although you will find some articles on this is that this this concept of you know change the practice of ethics and turned into into what is or can be called a checklist ethic okay so what we do is we look at the pro project we see okay this is written this is written this is written so it is ethical now this type of checklist ethic i personally i do not like and i still view that the project should be viewed as in totality looking at all aspects of the project rather than looking at you know uh, uh, ticking the boxes you sometimes call it tick the box ethic that okay those boxes are ticked so the project is okay now for example and this is the commonest mistake that i see in projects submitted to us in ethics committee the ethical justification section now most of the projects you know most of the ethics committees require that whenever you are writing a project you should have a section which says ethical justification okay so in this ethical justification section what people typically write there are three sentences or two or three sentences the project will be approved by the ethics committee informed consent will be taken basically this i mean that's all most of the projects have only these two sentences and in the ethics committee we see okay ethical justification section is there it's there patient information sheet is there present informed consent form is there present all the boxes are ticked so ethical part is taken care of okay so there that means there are not many ethical concerns now this this type of ethic and you know what helped this belmont report totally put uh, these four principles and i call this theory and others call this as principalism so we are we are only bothered about principle and if you have heard of the term gcp good clinical practice that was also you know starting to form up during those years 80s and 90s this gcp came gcp also converted the whole of research into a checklist kind of research which is more bothered about documentation than on you know actual i would say even actual conduct of the study uh, nevertheless these two gcp and belmont report totally transformed the ethics field and you know converted ethics ethics into checklist ethics but coming to the ethical justification section so you are writing your protocol so what should you write in your protocol so you see uh, in the ethical justification section now in taking informed consent and uh, ethical approval they are all all right but the actual justification requires you you to think and this process of thinking should not occur when you are writing your ethical justification of section of your study of your protocol but when you are planning your research question ethics starts at that point of time and it is extremely crucial you understand this part and it is very difficult to enter deeply into scientific aspects of your study proposed study for which you are writing your protocol but totally forgetting the ethical aspects which will come to haunt you later and because of which your study might be rejected by the ethics committee now i have n number of projects that have come to us which were not approved by ethics committees our ethics committee because of they might have been scientifically totally fine but there have there were some major ethical issues 
now these projects one i also remember there were some of the projects which were multi centric trials and had been approved at, at other centers some of the leading centers but which at pgi we could not approve because there was something in the protocol in the how the patient will be treated in the control arm that is the not the intervention arm the control arm which we have objected to and you see uh, later on the the funding agency the sponsors and uh, had to modify that part of the protocol and it was modified at all the other centers also and then the approval was given by us so this is the <clears throat> this is the one aspect of ethical justification so you write the ethical justification you say okay these are the possible benefits to the patient these are the possible harms these are the benefit possible benefits in future and these are the possible harms in future okay so you will you just cannot write off hand these statements you need to look at the background literature you need to think you need to discuss with your colleagues often from other specialties to write this simple statement which appears to be simple in fact it is not at all simple okay the second point that i want to make is that when you are writing the pro protocol and you have your idea of submitting it to the ethics committee many people think that the ethics committee will not look at the scientific aspects of the trial of the uh, study if the trial or even if it's not a trial now this is a totally wrong it's a misconception and i want to, you know i cannot stress this too strongly please even if there is some very very senior person you know uh, which who is saying that ethics committee should not look up at scientific aspects because i have listened to people some of the most respected senior people occupying the highest positions speak and say that ethics committees need not look into the science part of the protocol please note ethics committees should look into this they are bound to look into this they are duty bound uh, because the the ethics committees first and foremost responsibility is towards the, the patient okay and without a good science you can never have a have an ethical protocol an ethical project so when you are writing your science part of your pro protocol please consider that you will the ethics committee will have questions on the science part even on the study design even on the sample size calculation why let's say you have you plan a study in which there there is a uh, uh, you know a large large amount of inconvenience to the patient involved like say a couple of biopsies liver biopsies that need to be taken but the question is scientifically very very important and you say that okay we will allow this study even if there are say two additional biopsies to be taken because the question is so important but then you see that the sample size is so small that no meaningful conclusion will be possible so the ethics committee says that even though we are ready to permit you this additional biopsy but because you are not going to get any conclusions we will not allow this study to proceed so your sample size is inadequate okay the ethics committee can also tell you that okay your design is not suitable to answer this question you are planning a retrospective study uh, you know you want to look at the data but we uh, you know we are aware that some important elements of data might, might have been missing so you plan a prospective study out of this that even you know we have raised questions on even retrospective studies if we thought that these were unable to answer questions and you will think that you know retrospective study just nothing just looking at the data so that's the point i am stressing that when you are writing your protocol please look at it from the angle of ethics at that point of time 
uh, we have also raised objections as i said to the treatment given in the control arm maybe the dose of the uh, control drug was lesser or the duration was inadequate the highest dose was not reached so there can be you know at every step there can be an ethical question involved the final point i want to make is uh, uh, before i finish in the next 5 7 minutes is your how you write your patient information sheet and consent form in your uh, protocols because most of the time the patient information sheet is one document that almost all the ethics committee members will see you know what typically what happens in our ethics committee is all members do not read all the projects there are what we call reviewers two reviewers for each project who will look at one project each project is reviewed by four people let me share our internal you know secret we get around 30 projects plus minus 5 to 10 uh, more on plus side than on minus side every month so 30 plus projects every month four people see each project that is two reviewers the chairman of the ethics committee and myself but all all members get all the projects so what happens is most of the members will look at will not will not go into the details of all the projects of course the reviewers will go into the details but the members will look at the patient information sheet so if that sheet is not properly written you are likely to get a lot of queries from our side from the ethics committee side and you will need to change your uh, now it might not involve too much of effort on your part but what it leads to is unnecessary delay for getting project approval and unnecessary additional work for all of us in the ethics committee in you know, the office staff including me that means you know we have to write those comments to you the investigators you send your replies those replies are sent back to the reviewers to check sometimes we will wait for the next meeting that is after one month to get it approved sometimes uh, it is in my power to give the approval but many a times we have to wait till the next meeting so you see a simple document like patient information sheet and uh, let me tell you it is so frequently poorly written that i sometimes get surprised you know if i i look at the iq of people submitting those projects you know they are at the top most level of iqs that uh, submit our project the project to us the faculty colleague uh, you know they are masters in their field they are you know experts i mean amongst the top most experts in the world and i do not use this uh, word lightly the word world lightly they are really the top most people but there can be several reasons lack of time you know too many patients too much workload additional responsibilities administrative work and so on and this one thing is that this uh, many people will think this is not that important component so what should be the important components of a patient information sheet now the first thing that you need to write is the that first thing is that it is written in the language of you you are going to take part you if it is for children it becomes your child okay your child is going to take part in this study <laughs> so this language is very very important so you are write this so the first thing is your how you address the subject the patient the second thing is that the first line should say it is a research project it's a research you are going to take part in research okay because you have you you qualify to take part in this research because you have this disease or you can briefly mention the inclusion criteria because you have these features of the disease that you are so we are taking you you know we are you can take part in this study then you have to also write that your documents your data is confidential and cannot be shared with anyone except the uh, 
regulatory authorities or court your data will be confidential then you should write that this document in fact the confidentiality part is okay even if you write in the very very beginning and then you start this then you will say that the information given in this document will help you to decide whether you take part in the study or not okay and you will be very clear that it is your choice to take part and immediately you will say that even if you decide not to take part in the study your normal patient care will not be affected okay so don't think that because i am the pi and i am also your treating physician if you refuse i am this you know i it, it will compromise your uh, care i will fully devote to your care as i would have otherwise done okay if you took part in the study then you have to clearly mention in the pis the patient information sheet that you are free to ask questions any time as many questions as you want and you even here you can write that this patient information sheet these two pages and the consent form will be given to you you can take them back home read them discuss them with your uh, family members now many a times even my colleague uh, who have who criticize this part and they say that you know information to patient should not be given in a detailed manner it should be uh, somewhat uh, you know ambiguous sketchy incomplete because if we tell everything patients will not participate now i have uh, you know taken part as a pi co investigator in many dozens of clinical trials and uh, you know it it in fact i would say my experience has, has been and my colleagues experience has been totally con you know contrary to what uh, i was saying just now in fact the more information we provide to the patient the more likely they are to participate and the more likely they are they are to stay till the end of the trial you know uh, very often we earlier used to even uh, videograph our consent session and typically i i was not the person who is administering the consent that is who is informing the subject but one of the research scientists or a resident who is doing this but our instructions are very clear please tell them everything i mean everything that is reasonable of course this definition of reasonable can be debated but the important elements of the information should not be missed out okay the next part of the patient information sheet to tell about the study what this study is about why it is being done who is funding this study what procedures will be followed what are your duties what are your rights and so on please make sure the language is very very simple uh, the lay person of our ethics committee often looks at the language and will give comments that this language is too complicated for me to understand and many a times i have seen another mistake committed by our colleagues that they simply copy paste the method section of the patient information sheet into the uh, of the protocol into the patient information sheet the method section is copy pasted please please avoid this don't do this i understand that concepts of randomization and blinding can be difficult to explain but if you put your mind to it you can do it and we increasingly we are seeing that people are writing very good patient information sheets in simple language explaining the all the uh, you know uh, important elements we we have this the list of these elements is there on the pj website if you want to go and check again a very common mistake that we see is very you know again uh, surprising many times we get uh, protocols with patient information sheet and uh, consent form downloaded from the website and as such attached now that on the website we give a template of the patient information sheet it has to be filled with your study related relevant field okay so people don't do that just uh, copy uh, you know take a print out and attach that please don't do this read that 
patient information sheet it's extremely easy to fill those points there are no ambiguities no, not it's not even that time consuming but please make sure all those elements are there so then you describe in detail the procedure the how many follow up visits are there how much blood sample will be collected how much uh, you know how many visits the patient needs to make whether there will be any payments made for those visits please if there is a payment this payment amount has to be approved by the ethics committee it is very very clear you have to mention that amount like you you will write the a payment of rupees 500 per visit maximum will be given to the patient based on actual so if a patient presents a ticket which is for 300 40 50 rupees that money will be paid to the patient if the patient you know says that his his ticket cost 600 rupees you still pay 500 if your 500 amount has been approved by the ethics committee okay so this this part has to be very very clear then you have to inform the patient what he can do and what he cannot do right like what concomitant medications are allowed or not of course when i talk about medication just one point that skipped my mind is you have to tell about the drug the intervention that is being given what is that drug about what are its adverse reactions possible likely what is the incidence of those adverse reactions which ones are serious which are not which are important which are not in language that is simple and you know as per indian laws we have to mention that death can occur now for example if you are conducting a dermatology trial with some local application of a mild steroid cream we know that will not occur but indian law says that this sentence has to be mentioned that death can occur in which case compensation will be paid to the uh, family member uh, or the loc your guardian or the legally acceptable uh, representative so this sentence has to be there so you know this was this is what i was saying everything has to be told to the patient and many of our colleagues object to this that they say you know death cannot occur so if we tell them patient will refuse then it's the question of building rapport with your patient and how you explain to him these things now let me tell you we have done some a, a number of healthy volunteer studies in which patients are not getting any therapeutic benefit at all and we have we have to include this sentence death can occur even then we have rarely faced problems in recruiting healthy patients healthy volunteers in our phase 1 trials because of the way we explain with patients we take time we give them time to think about it discuss of course many participants refuse but those who come they are very loyal and increasingly you know what happens is that even if they would uh, by chance meet you on the street they often ask is there any other st similar study coming up we would like to take part in that study okay then you have to talk about women participants specifically in the patient information sheet with respect to pregnancy and breastfeeding whether those women are allowed to take part whether contraception will be required double contraception <laughs> double contraception will be required and so on okay these things have to be uh, added uh, then you have to talk about the compensation section which is separate now as per indian guidelines for study related injury compensation has to be paid okay now this is followed quite diligently in regulatory trial that is pharma company trial which companies will use to market their products much less i would say nil not for investigator initiated trial but still this clause has to be there as per guidelines that patients are entitled to compensation for serious adverse events which are related to intervention or the uh, that has to be proved that it is due to intervention then in patient information sheet 
we have to talk about their right to withdraw from the study we have to talk about additional information that if anything new comes up it is the duty of the investigator to inform the patients of that then one thing again a common mistake that uh, people make in the patient information sheet you have to give your name address and contact in the patient information sheet but you also have to give the name and address of the convener or the chairman of the ethics committee okay both these have to be there so this should complete your patient information sheet part then comes the consent part the consent part again there are some standard sentences which are there in the even on pj website so each has to be uh, you know initialed by the patient uh, you please go and check that and finally in some studies uh, you know we because blood banks uh, these tissue banks are coming up we ask for patient consent to be given for any future research on stored samples this is an additional new component which we can discuss during uh, this question answer session i think i have taken slightly more than i intended but please go ahead with any questions and uh, comments thank you sir for the very informative talk and discussing all the aspects of ethical considerations we have a few questions in the chat box i'll go one by one the first question is by dr minakshi which says can we make modifications in the originally proposed ethical protocol does it require complete submission and do we need ethical clearance for healthy subjects also okay so the first part of the question is modification is in a protocol you see uh, now strictly this is not in the domain of the ethics part of uh, um, this talk but it is in the protocol writing domain now when ethics committee approves the project that project you have to conduct your study according to that project if you want to make some change in that protocol it has to be approved by the ethics committee before you implement that change for example if some inclusion exclusion criteria are changed if the dosage of some drug is changed if uh, if some duration of therapy is changed if definition of some end point is changed they have to be pre approved by ethics committee there are some elements which do not need approval for example there is some situation in which the health of the patient there is uh, hazard to the health of the patient that is immediate and you cannot uh, uh, afford to wait for a six committee approval you implement that protocol modification immediately because of that uh, the seriousness ness urgency of the situation but you write to the six committee that we have made this modification in emergency setting but you will subsequently need it to be approved there are some changes that don't need a six committee approval but still you need to inform the six committee like change in some office staff or change in some duty what we call duty delegation law you know some duties are assigned from one person to another uh, but this at the level of research staff if there is addition of a co investigator that needs a six committee approval what was the other part of the question uh, healthy volunteers yes you obviously you very importantly you need you know uh, approval for all studies that have healthy volunteers now let me say uh, recently we had a problem uh, in which case uh, there was a investigator who administered a very simple looking form which was an online form that was filled by the subject and the uh, you know the, the investigator analyzed the data there were no questions which were you know which could be thought of as offensive or uh, uh, in any case damaging to the subject that he wrote a paper and he sent the paper for publication to an international journal the journal said give me the ethics committee approval now the author argued 
that since there is no ethical issue involved i i continued without ethical approval now this you know this has uh, led to a very uh, difficult situation but that's why i'm saying as far as we are concerned you are concerned please send all research projects to the ethics committee if you think that this project does not need ethics committee approval in your covering letter you write that please give me exemption from ethical review for example if it's a systematic review that looking at published data you don't need ethics committee review although we keep getting all these projects all the time so you just need to write please give me exemption from ethics review and the ethics committee should give exemption but all this is based on the standard operating procedures the sops developed by the ethics committees at their institutions so in our case we allow such exemption and we will immediately issue an exemption letter okay but for all practical purposes the investigator you do not decide as far as you are concerned you have to send everything to ethics committee okay okay so the next question is can we add or remove secondary objectives once the study protocol is approved and if yes what are the requirements for that you see in in principle you should not modify your primary objectives and secondary objectives once the study has started and some patients have enrolled if you have not yet started the study it is still okay to change because once the study has started and you see that okay you know 25% patients have been enrolled and you see uh, on this particular primary end point the effect might not come but on this is a secondary end point and i am likely to see statistically significant difference in this secondary so i'll change secondary to primary primary to secondary this should not be done you should give adequate scientific justification for why you are doing this even if you look at some of the very leading trials published in uh, the leading journal they often modify their endpoints they often add some new endpoints remove some old endpoints now this has to be looked at very very cautiously by ethics committees and and even more responsibility is of the peer reviewers who look at the published papers of these articles what endpoints were modified and why they were modified okay okay sir thank you sir the next question is after completion of a study do we need to submit any report to the ethics committee you see not only you have to submit a report at the completion of the study you have to submit annually okay annual of course most people don't submit but in ideal scenario we you know ethics committee gives approval for one year and every year you have to submit the report and based on that report the ethics committee gives allows you to continue the study for the next year and of course uh, complete study completion report has to be sent and do we have any checklist for ethical consideration so that we can follow so that we don't miss any point you see that's why i was trying to stress during the presentation part that please stay away from that checklist system you apply your minds to the study that you are doing you think what are the ethical considerations involved whether it how beneficial it is to the patient Uh, the new drug that you are giving or new intervention what you are doing what are the possible sources of harm what care you are taking to avoid those harms what care you are taking to not only prevent but if something happens to tackle those harms what happens if the patient is not given given that intervention what happens uh, what benefits the patient is likely to get you know you give it a thought then you write your ethical justification section please keep away from checklist but this is this is this is not a you know the way you should answer if you are answering a question in your viva practical exam then you talk about those checklist calls okay 
Professor. Another question is, do we require ethical clearance for all types of research in case where the PI is an independent researcher not affiliated with university or an organization, where to get ethical clearance in such cases? So you see, uh, the first part is easy. You cannot do any research without ethics committee approval. Simply not permissible. I mean, of course, you can debate on this. I would say there are some types of research which should be kept exempt from ethics review, but the current ICMR guidelines and other guidelines in the world say, no, nothing should be done without ethics committee approval. So that part we are very clear. Although I have my differences with this, I don't agree, but still you have to. The second part is if you are an independent, say a private practitioner or uh, you know some uh, lab in charge somewhere you have some data you want to analyze so there are there is one way to go about it you have to get affiliated with some ethics committee that should be within 50 kilometers range of your organization or institute or your place of practice and that ethics committee has to agree to review your proposal okay so to uh, prerequisites are there. Both have to be satisfied to, for you to approve uh, to get that ethics committee approval. We often take projects of other institutes. For example, uh, let me share with you that a new institute comes up. PJ is the mentor institution, and they don't yet have ethics committee, but they want to do some research. So it needs the approval of their director, our director, who are the ultimate authorities. And then our ethics committee reviews the proposal of those institutes so that we have done in the past. But if you are single alone, you need to get attached to some ethics committee and get that approval. Another question by Dr. Minakshi Sharma is that in health education or behavioral trials, in the consent form, we inform the patients about two groups. That is one group with video and another group without video training. Many times patients wish to shift to second group if randomization has put them in without video group. It means such trials allocation concealment can't be done. Prima, hi fi question. So what is the what is the question in this? Yes, ma'am. Can you please uh, specify what is the question in this? Dr. Minakshi? So okay. another question here. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, sir. This problem is this, sir. When we fill up the guidelines for conducting RCTs, they are usually asked in behavior trials, you are not performing blinding and what was the benefit of doing allocation concealment because uh, what is the right way to do it? Like when we tell the patients in one group, you'll be getting a booklet. In another group, you'll be getting a video-based training. They tend to shift to the video-based training. So what our researchers should do? Should I tell them in the consent in the patient information sheet that, okay, there'll be two techniques of delivering you health education and we should refrain ourselves from giving them details about health education. What we should do, sir? So again, this is not an ethics question, but a science question, the study design question. First of all, if a person is randomized to a particular intervention, in no circumstance should that be changed. If you do that, your whole RCT is gone. The single most important component of an RCT is randomization. In no circumstance should randomization be interfered with. Please be very, very clear about it. Second part is about blinding and allocation concealment. Now, these are two different issues. Now, blinding is, of course, everyone understands the patient and a matching placebo patient gets a treat drug versus matching placebo. Both are identical. No one knows what patient is getting. This, in such case where one is video arm, one is text arm, there will be no blending possible. Okay. So when you are taking patient consent, when you are discussing about the patient, you know, uh, uh, 
in, uh, giving information to the patient you have to inform the patient that you will be allocated to one of these two arms in one arm it is uh, uh, the text in the other arm it's the video okay so if the patient agrees that okay i can be, go to one of these two arms only then patient is uh, you know allowed to take part in the study but once the patient has agreed to this that okay i will go to any of these arms that then the patient is randomized now if the patient has been randomized when you open your allocation concealment envelope okay then you cannot allow the patient to change you say that we discussed with this before you cannot change now you will have to remain in this arm okay uh sir uh, can i ask uh, something sir like then where is the principle of intention to treat come sir like if i tell the patient that you cannot shift into the booklet uh, arm and you you have to remain in the video arm only uh, you have to remain in the booklet arm only and you cannot shift to the video you see then in intention to treat so like, this is something ethical patient has been asking this thing okay i don't want i want to shift into that group what should we no. do at that time sir you you cannot do this simple very simple you okay, cannot sir. if if you okay, are sir. if you want to talk about intention to treat if you see if there is a patient who was allocated to the test arm but based on some reason whatever was the reason it was shifted to video arm in the intention to treat analysis this patient will be counted as that arm to which the patient was randomized okay not what the patient actually got so what happens as a result of this is that the difference between the two arms tends to get reduced this occurs very very commonly in when you are comparing drug with placebo okay the difference between the two arms get decreased and the chances of getting statistical approval are reduced but again this is a long topic and you know it will take me an hour to explain the nuances of intention to treat and other related analysis we can we should move to the next question yes sir one is is it necessary to take ethical clearance if we are using previously available data of the patients like radiographs that were taken as a part of their treatment only as i said ethics committee approval will be required in this case also including in everything else that you can think of currently one thing you will need to the question that will come to you from ethics committee is whether you are able to get consent of the patient for that research okay many a times the ethics committee will can say that you try to obtain consent and include only those patients who give consent even if they are radiographs stored for with you sometimes the ethics committee will say you will say that i cannot get consent because the patients are long gone we do not have their addresses some patients may have already died then you have to write what is called a request for waiver of consent you write to the ethics committee that for these reasons consent is not possible please give me waiver of consent then the ethics committee decides whether to give you that waiver or not okay sir uh, another question that has been answered i guess uh, the next is do we need ethical clearance for retrospective study based on reports of the patients yes it's the same as radiograph you will need this uh, again question of waiver of consent will remain absolutely yes. same okay and in an institution with separate scientific committee is in place whether for doing systematic reviews ethical approval is required or not you see uh, for systematic reviews even if there are no scientific committees ethics committee approval is not required they are exempt from ethics review okay sir that's it thank you so much sir for the very informative talk and very patiently answering all the questions I will request Meenu ma'am to now say a few words. Thank you. Thank you Professor Samir for such an elaborate discussion of ethical aspects of research protocols.
and you very patiently discussed uh, the various components of uh, you know ethical protocol which are there uh, the informed consent and the uh, patient information sheet and all other aspects uh, i think they are very practically oriented the things because right now we are trying to lead these uh, participants to write a research protocol along with ethical justification so thank you very much uh, i hope we'll join you for another session again so thank you uh, dr harnoor for conducting the session you may now close thank you okay thanks dr minu thank you pleasure thank you thank you sir thank you, thank you ma'am thank you all the participants for joining today and listening to all this patiently we it is a two day workshop so we will be gathering again tomorrow at 10 am for the remaining lectures thank you so much there is an attendance link in the chat box i would request everyone to fill that and thank you so much everyone hope to see you again tomorrow and uh -huh.